Here we go. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening for an investment presentation that Jamie and I are putting on for the Integrity Mortgage Note Fund. Uh, we will be going through a high-level presentation tonight. We have a lot more data information and slides we could share with everybody, but we wanted to try and value everyone's time and get things at a high level, answer a lot of the questions that we've been asked and people have asked in the time frame, but also just give people uh, kind of an intro to it. And if you have follow-up questions, feel free to set up a call with Jamie or I. Uh, where we can hop on a call and walk through any questions, comments you have and get more in detail. But we are gonna go into detail tonight, but there's always, you know, something- There's always more we, detail. <laughs> yeah, as, as most of you know, I can talk forever and I don't wanna be here till 11 o'clock. So, uh, Jamie, why don't you do a disclaimer? Disclaimer, this webinar and subsequent PPM is provided solely for convenience and does not constitute investment or legal advice. I'm not going to read the entire slide to you all. I know you are plenty capable. And um, the uh, related documents are confidential. Yep. And again, this is for informational purposes only. So, so tonight, we'll, you know, what are our discussion points? We'll give an intro. For those of you who don't know, Jamie and I will talk a little bit about ourselves. Then we'll roll into uh, the notes and bolts, which is what is the Integrity Mortgage Note Fund? Uh, the opportunities we're going to be looking to target, the structure of the fund with the financial projections, and then uh, we'll have some Q&As at the end for everybody uh, at that point in time as well. Chris, you want to talk about me? <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. So I know several of you have, have invested with Chris before. Many of you may not be as familiar with me. Um, I have been an active real estate investor since 2010. and um, primarily focused on rental properties initially, uh, single family rentals. We did several rehabs and uh, we still, we have a, we've been slowly growing our rental portfolio over the last few years. Um, but about three, three and a half years ago, transitioned over to mortgage notes and um, still have the, the rental property uh, part of things going, but probably 90% of my time and energy as far as uh, business goes, is uh, focused on mortgage notes. So I'm not going to read this, this slide to you either, but um, I do have experience in the title business and mortgage business. Uh, I worked for a title company years ago as a settlement officer, as a notary, driving around all around the state of Maryland, uh, explaining documents to people, doing refinances. This was pre-crash, pre if you will, <laughs> uh, 2000. Uh, two to 2004 ish. And then I worked for a, a mortgage broker in the funding department working. Uh, I also worked in the funding department at the, at the uh, title company as well. Uh, served as a captain in the U S army. I've, I've held numerous leadership positions uh, professionally as well as coaching. Um, but uh, like I, like I mentioned in the last few years have transitioned over to primarily investing in first lien mortgage notes, both performing and non-performing and I find it a fascinating and really promising asset class. I'm really intrigued by it and, and uh, have started to do well with it. Um, Chris and I uh, have worked together for about three years now. Chris has been doing notes for a little bit longer. Um, and that's a little bit about me. I mean, I, I definitely recommend if, if anybody watching this or listening to this, if you're not familiar with either of us, absolutely do do a background check, do your research on us, because that's really the number one uh, key piece in my mind if I'm a, a passive investor looking to invest in, in this fund. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, for those that don't know me, I am Chris Seveny. I've been in real estate uh, since I graduated college in the late 90s. I worked my way from uh, I was working for a general contractor for 15 years, then I made the swap to a developer. Uh, around the 2011 12 timeframe. Uh, at that point in time, the individual I was working for also was very entrepreneurial and had a lot of rentals and other uh, assets in his portfolio and basically looked at me and said, You know, what are you doing? You know, you got you to gotta grow your own. You know, you're not going to be able to retire based off of just your nine to five job. So for me, uh, for most of you know the story, we built our single family residence, took the equity out of that, but did some strategies. My wife and I are in the Washington, D.C. area. 
very difficult uh, to scale in this market um, without excessive cash and a lot of time. And it was really more of the time than the cash because of just trying to get assets. Jamie's not too far from me. He's about an hour north of uh, DC. Um, and uh, interesting story I'll share, um, you know, how Jamie and I kind of got acquainted was Jamie, um, you know, was a JV partner of mine and we did a deal together. And then through that time, he started buying his own assets and, you know, we'd always consult and go back and forth on things and use each other's sounding boards, similar to how I used to with Gail Greenberg. Uh, and Jamie continued to grow his business, um, got over 40 notes in his portfolio. Um, and that's kind of how we got together. For me, I've got uh, over right around 300 active notes um, in the portfolio right now, uh, bought and sold probably over 400 notes in five years. So uh, I've been pretty active. Uh, and really, most of those have been since uh, 2019. In 2019, I bought over 100 notes, uh, 2020 over 100 this year. I think to date, uh, I'm somewhere between 75 and 100 notes already acquired in the first quarter. So when people talk about uh, the availability of assets uh, and where things you know, stand. We'll talk about that later on, but that's kind of uh, something we can touch upon. So if you have, like Jamie mentioned, individual questions uh, about us, uh, both of us can provide a laundry list of references for people um, to uh, check on. But I just advise everyone, no matter where you're investing, always make sure you just know who you're investing with. Okay, so what is Integrity Mortgage Note Fund? So uh, we'll call it IMNF, uh, Integrity Mortgage Note Fund. So it's a closed end Regulation D 506C fund. So what does that mean? It means it's only open to accredited investors. So a credit investor is, um, there's rules out there. It's a net worth over a million dollars outside your primary residence. I believe it's $200,000 a year income solely or 300,000 jointly with a significant other uh, is what an accredited status is. Uh, we're gonna primarily focus on first position, uh, performing and non-performing. It's gonna be heavier towards non-performing with a mix of performing in there to keep a balanced uh, portfolio. You don't want you know, all non-performing in a fund, but it'll be a balanced mix. It's a Th uh, three year lockup period. Um, I realizing I spelled committed wrong um, in this slide. I apologize, but uh, it's three year commitment at uh, $25,000 is a minimum. We have a preferred return of seven to 11% annualized depending on the amount of the investment. Plus we're gonna be giving 25% excess distributions to investors. So the goal is to 11 to 15% annualized return to the investors. Uh, there is a management fee uh, that we have, which is based on the assets under management. And that's something I'll also mention people when you review PPMs, understand what that management fee is based off of. I've seen them based off of UPB or property value. And when you're buying assets at 50 cents on the dollar or even less, uh, that management fee isn't based off of the money that they've raised. It's based off of that. It can, um, you know, enhance the, uh, the sponsor's numbers. So uh, those are a few of things uh, I'll mention also. The PPM and the documents were written by Brian Gallagher, who's the attorney that, uh, out of Maryland who I use a lot. He's written, uh, this is the fifth PPM he has written for me. So I just wanted to kind of touch upon that. And also, you know, the excess distributions. Um, that's something we just wanted to share with people because a lot of funds you're going to see out there right now, uh, and we're not trying to compete with others, um, but we just like to compare and use comparisons where a lot of the other funds will mention, you know, just have preferred returns up to a specific number. We want to give investors a little bit of that upside uh, as well versus just a preferred return. Uh, so uh, we'll go through, you know, we'll hold all questions to the end. So if people have them, you know, you can just hold off till the end and, uh, you know, we'll answer them at that time because we may end up answering them for you uh, throughout this uh, process. Next is going to be target returns. I'll let Jamie talk about kind of the profile for what we're targeting. Yeah, so there are currently over $600 billion in distressed mortgage notes across the U.S. Um, as you all can imagine, the pandemic and uh, everything going on uh, recently is likely going to only uh, create further opportunity further distress, uh, which le leads to opportunity. And so 
essentially we're looking at these four primary components when it comes to profiling the assets that we're going to target. So location, location, location. No, we're not investing directly in hard real estate, but the collateral is that hard real estate. So the location of the real estate, especially with first lien mortgage notes that we focus on, that location is critical. Um, so we invest in areas with low to moderate crime and areas with stabilized home prices. So we are mostly staying away from you know, a lot of the coasts where you'll see a lot of swings in appreciation. So um, the numbers tend to work a little bit better with assets in the Midwest, Southeast, but um, and frankly, we're not hesitant to go into uh, other states where the numbers make sense. Property type, we purchase uh, residential mortgage notes backed by properties that are single family, duplex, townhouse, uh, that most people on this call hopefully are, are familiar with. So the note is in first position. We typically do not purchase notes secured by properties uh, which are vacant land or mobile homes uh, unless they're included in a large pool. So we'll have our buy box, you know, but a lot of times if you're, uh, if you can go outside of your, your buy box a little bit, you can take down a larger asset pool, a larger tape and get better pricing. Um, so that's, that's good for all of us. Um, value, we normally, we will acquire notes that are where the property value is between 25,000 and 400,000. So it's quite a range there. Um, and again, that valuation of that collateral is critical. And then ROI, so on an individual asset basis, this is not returns of the fund overall or anything, but our pricing, pricing our bids will be based on a 30% return uh, for each asset. And that's non-performing. Non-performing so, asset, yeah, right. right. So uh, a few things I'll just mention that uh, I know people ask, you know, what about CFDs in seconds? Uh, you know, we bought CFDs in the past. You don't see a lot of them anymore, to be honest. So uh, if there was a specific on opportunity where the price was right, we would po possibly consider them uh, just to let people know that. And then uh, on the second space, uh, you know, we're not second, we don't invest in seconds. Now, if we were buying a pool of, you know, 50 assets that had, you know, a sprinkle of two or three seconds in it, that was part of it, then yes, but our main focus is not going to be targeted uh, to, you know, that criteria. And the same thing on value. I mean, our value is a wide range, but we're not going to be looking at, you know, severely distressed properties uh, in, you know, areas that are severely depressed, um, you know, and so forth, uh, you know, there might be some of those sprinkled into a fund which you take and your price is, you know, significantly reduced uh, for buying those to reduce any potential risk. But, you know, our typical property uh, that we like to look at is you now properties between 50 and 100,000 plus uh, dollars. Um, and then, you know, the note value that, you know, can also provide us again, back to that return that we target 30% return. And the only thing I wanna to mention too, regarding our assets, uh, one of the things I've done in my past funds and Jamie and I are gonna do on this one is, you know, the investors who invest in the fund, they'll know what assets we're investing in. We share that information. You're not investing in a black box of where'd my money go or what are you buying? You'll be able to see, uh, you know, the list of the assets and the information on the assets. So you know exactly where your money is actually going. So I just want to hit, make that point as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, Jamie, I'll let you yep. talk about the benefits as well. Benefits of notes uh, versus other alternative investments. Um, it's kind of funny. I've been so involved with notes in the last few years. It doesn't even seem like an alternative investment, but uh, Notes can provide passive cash flow, so obviously that's more on the performing side. But uh, it can. Chris and Chris and I have a podcast, and we talk about is note investing passive or not. You know, well, it depends. Depends how you define passive, but you can absolutely. It's not, it's not physically demanding, um, and if we can get a non-performing asset to perform, it's really mailbox money, and it, at that point, it certainly is passive. So compared to owning the physical real estate which both Chris and I are, are very familiar with, um, owning the secured debt does not subject you to dealing with tenants, toilets, and termites. Um, so there's some, some real benefit there. Portfolio management, essentially this gets to scale. Uh, you, can, you can do this from, from anywhere. 
Um, so, you know, you don't need to be driving to, I think, uh, uh, our JV deal that we did, Chris is the only property I've actually personally been to, <laughs> uh, with my, uh, own note portfolio, if you will. So, um, there's no need to physically, you know, uh, go to these, these assets and, and check them out. So it, it's portfolio management is definitely a benefit with note investing. Um, so the management, Obviously, Chris and I are the primary managers of the fund, but we will have a team of vendors and people we work with regularly uh, comprising attorneys, a servicing company, realtors, preservation companies, and other vendors for sure. Um, unlike rentals, like I said, where investors often um, invest in their own backyard, they want, maybe oftentimes want to go and see the property, see that it's still standing. And that's how I started out with my own rental portfolio. A note portfolio can be more diversified geographically, which really helps mitigate some of that risk and spread the, the risk out uh, from a geographic standpoint. So portfolio management definitely is a benefit with note investing. Um, profit, profitability in varying market conditions. Um, we're certainly seeing some varying market conditions for sure, but there's always a, an opportunity behind distress, like I said earlier, and um, you know, note prices in the marketplace function in relation to supply and demand. So they are, they can be correlated to real estate values. Obviously real estate values right now are sky high, generally speaking. That's only a benefit with regard to notes because that's your collateral. So that's, that's a good thing. It makes the safety even a, more of a factor there. Um, the big difference with notes is that profits increase in a down market. Like I said, we're going to see more and more distressed, which means more and more opportunity. Note prices are going to go down, which means that's a buying opportunity. So even in a down economy, people need a place to live. And so we see notes as a, a solid, uh, solid asset class for sure. Collateral, like I, like I touched on already, collateral prices are just going up and up and up. That's only a good thing, especially if you're in the first lien space. Versatility. There are numerous exit strategies with notes. You know, we're not going to sit here and tell you that we're going to predict every, every uh, exit for every deal that we acquire. You can't always predict every one, but we both Chris and I have experience with just about every exit strategy when it comes to non-performing assets. And that may be getting the borrower to reperform. That may be doing a modification, selling that reperforming note. That may be foreclosing if we have to. That's not our first choice. You know, we certainly want to work with with borrowers and keep them in their homes. Um, but numerous exit strategies with non-performers. We may buy some performing notes. You know, that that helps with cash flow, keeps the fund moving forward, and keeps it profitable for everyone. Um, those obviously you're not able to add quite as much value to as as you are with a non-performing asset. So. Lots of exit strategies. It's one of the things that really did draw me to notes initially. Um, you know, so in, in my mind, you're kind of getting in a little bit earlier in the, uh, the cycle, if you will. And so, you know, I've exited non-performing notes uh, through a, a buy and hold rental property that I still hold in Jacksonville, for example. So, you know, there's, there's lots, of, lots of versatility with notes. I've even created my own exit strategies. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> I've been able to get a little creative um, on certain in <laughs> some of these. It's uh, when you just kind of run ideas through. Uh, so next, I want to talk about market research. And what I want to talk about on this is really what's going on in the world today, because that's the number one question everyone asks uh, regarding uh, the note space and real estate in general. And it's interesting because uh, some of you know, uh, end of last year, I finished my uh, studies at Georgetown, which I was getting a master's in real estate um, development finance uh, from there. And my thesis actually was basically the Integrity Mortgage Note Fund. It was raising money for a, uh, a, a note fund. So I had to do a lot of market research and I had access to a lot of uh, scholar reports and reports from a lot of really smart people on kind of the economy in general, where things are headed and where they continue to head. And one of the things that, you know, with COVID, you know, that we were seeing was, you know, 2020, you know, is an outlier with the delinquencies increasing. And how is that going to affect into 2021, which we're in now? And then what is the government going to do to try and slow down a lot of these delinquencies 
which they only really can control about half the loans in the country because those are the ones that are covered by the government-sponsored entities, Fannie and the Freddie, where the other half of loans in this country are really owned by the banks may hold them or private investors, hedge funds, us and other investors. Uh, so, you know, things we've really started seeing is those, those foreclosure rates and transition rates um, where loans are moving. You can see the 60 to 90 days in the bottom, you know, of the slide, uh, you know, where things are really starting to move. But what really, uh, you know, I saw this the other day, really opens everybody's eyes is the FHA delinquency rates, which an FHA loan typically only requires about 3% down. And I believe back in 2008, 9, 10, that rate fluctuated between about 14 and 16%. And right now we're up over 17%. Now, the differences between a decade ago and now is a lot of people have equity in the property, which they didn't have back then. Now, could that equity evaporate? Yes, it could. But what you may see is you may see more bankruptcies, uh, which, you know, bankruptcy is something that I've got a lot of experience in, Jamie's got experience in, and buying notes. And actually, I love buying in bankruptcy uh, because it opens up a lot of information that's unavailable to the investor. But just to kind of share with people where we think the market is going, uh, you can clearly see, I think, where things are at we're gonna to start to see a lot more delinquencies coming. Now the time frame, nobody can know because it's really gonna be controlled by the states and the government. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we wanna make sure we do, when we bid on assets, uh, for example, you know, we do take into consideration longer foreclosure timeframes on delinquent loans. I've been doing that for over a year now. Um, you know, Jamie's been doing the same thing. So it's something that, you know, if it's a 12 month uh, foreclosure timeframe, I may, pencil it out at 18 to 20 months. And that's how we come to our number uh, from that perspective. But again, crystal ball, we're gonna see more. We're gonna probably see more distressed debt come on the market. The question is, when is it really gonna open up? And we don't know because uh, really the government has a lot of uh, the, uh, you know, the control over that at this point in time. So now we're going to roll into the fund structure and we'll spend a few minutes on the slide because there's a lot of information on it. Jamie will go through it and, uh, you know, together we can uh, discuss uh, some of the topics on this as well. Yeah. So the fund structure, um, CCAS Capital is an LLC of mine. Chris and I will co-manage and uh, provide strategic direction together. And then we'll partner with outside investors. Uh, hopefully many of you, listening and watching tonight and uh we'll put our funds into the fund and then we'll buy uh non-performing and performing notes so we'll we'll have four different classes class a b c and d and each of those classes will correlate to a specific preferred return so class a um you know i think you get the point seven eight nine ten eleven so um the fund revenue comes in. You can see the, the diagram here. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, um, but we will pay out the preferred return prior to taking the management fee. And then we will distribute excess distributable cash with the 25 to 75 split. So that's one of the things, again, the highlight uh, for investors and um, that, the, you know, we are paying the preferred return before the management fee. Uh, so that's one thing I just wanna reiterate to people is the investors get paid first. So they would get that. And then after we get the fee, if there's excess distributable, that will get um, distributed down the line and so forth. And the way the excess distributable is determined, it's on a yearly basis. Uh, we use a third party bookkeeper who will, you know, do the books. And then we have a third party CPA who provides returns, the tax returns, and typically will also do what's called a balance sheet audit uh, for them to review and analyze the balance sheet uh, for, for investors as well. I'll, I'll stipulate to people, it's a little different than a full gap audit. A full gap audit looks at policies, procedures. It's really more for larger firms. If investors wanted us to go down that road, we'd be more than happy to do it. But just to give you an idea, a balance sheet audit is really looking at all the expenses and making sure you know things are done properly, and you know 
that cost is X to do the gap audit because of the reporting process that they'd have to do is about three X. So um, typically in the past, investors in my other funds have been happy with the audits that have been getting done, but uh, we can do uh, you know whatever the investors want, honestly. Um, and we do again provide copies of the books um, you know on a to the investors uh, at request as well, and issue them a quarterly basis when we issue the returns. So good. Uh, let's see, and then, so now we're gonna roll into the financial projections. Uh, and somebody asked a question, these slides gonna be given out after the presentation. Yes, this is recorded, I'll reiterate this is recorded. Um, we can issue these slides to everyone, so you can all have these as well. Uh, so as Jamie mentioned earlier, here's kind of the anticipated returns um, for performing, subperforming, non-performing, and deed in lieu, uh, kind of where things fall. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, uh, slide, um, but typically you're performing, we're at 10 to 12, and then 25, um, you know, is what we target. You know, like we mentioned, we pencil them out at 30. And again, we're trying to get investors in 11 to 15% annual return. We just want to, again, reiterate, you know, that funds inherently speculative. There's no specific return on capital um, or anything we can promise or guarantee. So we just want to reiterate that again. And also wanted to show two waterfall types, the class A and the class um, E for people who have a minimum of million dollar investment with 11% preferred return. Uh, we show the graph to basically show, you know, the percentage that all goes to the members up front before we see anything. Uh, and then once it hits that 11% mark, you know, then it starts getting distributed, but you can still see um, where things fall on this uh, from that perspective. And then on the class E, we'll just show, and again, we have slides in the full presentation. We'll send these out to everyone. We have one for each individual, you know, each class member, but we didn't need to go through them uh, all tonight. Just kind of wanted to give people an idea, but it's very similar. Um, people with the minimum investment, again, they get their preferred return before any of these uh, I'm targeting our way. So I just wanted to uh, mention that as well. Uh, Few things I also just want to mention while we're on the distributions, uh, they are issued on a quarterly basis. Uh, we still try and target that first quarter to hit distributions, but sometimes it might be challenging because when you look at how the note buying process goes, you close the fund. Even if we had assets under agreement at that time, you know, still have to do due diligence, which would probably take two to three weeks. Then about four to five weeks to board that loan. You're already at two months. So, um, you know, there are some initial fund expenses of, you know, creating the PPM and stuff. So we try and get those covered, but if there was an asset that maybe got paid off or something, but, you know, we, we always try our best, but the first quarter possibly, um, then second quarter would be kind of that target. If we miss a quarter, there is, uh, you know, it's not like it's lost, it gets made up. Back to you, clawback is another term that they'll use. So if you invested, um, you know, simple numbers, 100,000, 7% annually, 7,000, of course I didn't do it because <laughs> now I'm dividing by four, um, you know, from that perspective, which is about 1677, um, you know, you'd be do that plus the, uh, that second component um, in that time. So I just want to mention that as well uh, from that and the excess is issued on a yearly basis. Jamie, were you going to mention something? Oh, just the 100,000 is 8%, so um, oh, might sorry. might actually be <laughs> easier math for you. But yeah, the uh, preferred return is mm -hmm. quarterly, but it may not be for a few quarters, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. uh, profit mm -hmm. splits or excess distribution would be annually. Yeah. So. And the other thing I'll mention is if you want to reinvest your distributions, you have that ability to. So if you wanted to invest them, they could be reinvested in the fund as well. So next steps, Jamie, do you want to kind of roll through this and then we'll take on some questions? Yeah, next steps. If you are interested in investing, you'd complete a subscription agreement and questionnaire. Uh, we would submit Form D and then uh, the fund subclasses are closed. So we'll determine exactly what date this first subclass will be closed. We're anticipating sometime mid-May um, and then investors provide funds, operating agreement is executed, and then uh, we acquire assets 
that's uh, that's when the fun begins yeah. <laughs> the so, fun and the fund <laughs> yeah and just so everyone's aware um you know a form d because i have people ask that's a form that our attorney fills out when we have an investor whatever state you're in we have to submit to the state that we have an investor in that state um submitted to to know that they're investing in the fund so just want to highlight that so um and next uh basically you know questions for people um happy to answer questions uh for investors uh if people have any feel free to either you can put them in the chat or put them in the q a uh either one Everyone's quiet tonight. I know people have questions. We couldn't have covered everything. Yeah, we had a lot of a lot of people registered, so it was good. Okay, how is AUM calculated? So the assets under management calculated. Great question. So that is based off of uh, the balance sheet. So. Um, it's basically, it's the assets, total assets under the balance sheet. So if we invested um, in the fund, uh, you know, we bought, say, a million dollars worth of loans, uh, and then um, essentially, you know, include the expenses, it's primarily, it's going to end up being the amount of money we raised um, on the fund is really typically what it ends up and being in that standpoint. So it'll almost certainly be a lot lower than principal balance. Yes, it'll be lower than principal balance or the, uh, the value of the property. Right. So we got some other good questions here. Yep. Okay, so we got a bunch of them come through. Is there yeah. any interest on investments paid monthly or quarterly? Uh, the, um, so the interest is based, uh, so the interest does not compound um, in that sense, but if you reinvest it, then it does go to add to your actual investment for share purposes, and then that would end up increasing the interest uh, from that perspective. Uh, let's see, how much percent of performing, non-performing, and sub-performing will be, and who will decide? <laughs> well, Jamie and I will decide, uh, but typically in my prior funds, it fluctuates between kind of 65 and 75% non-performing and 25 to 35% performing. So I'm just going to read these other questions. Okay. Yep. Um, how does this fund differ from your existing fund, Chris? So this one is uh, very it's similar to some of the other funds I've had. The Structure was a little different on the payouts uh, from that perspective. And the main difference on this fund also is while this fund is a closed fund, it's also open in the same time, meaning that uh, the integrity mortgage note from a year from now, if people were like, okay, I didn't want to invest today, but maybe in a year from now, they could invest in the fund, but it would be a completely separate investment and your assets and everything would be different from the people who invest in today. So it's like two separate LLCs or a series LLC. They're called, I believe, subclasses in the- uh, It's really like a separate fund. fund. Yeah, subclass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you two have worked together. I like this question, Dan. Mm -hmm. You two have worked together for a while, but running a business is stressful. If you two don't get along, what happens? Who stays? Apologies for the tough question, but it's important. Yeah. It is important. <laughs> so, uh, I wouldn't arm wrestle because I'd lose uh, from that perspective. Um, that, no, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And Jamie and I, uh, you know, have, like I said, we've been working together. We've done no deals together. Uh, the way we've structured it, so people, because it's probably another question, who's doing what in the fund, uh, is there's certain states Jamie is very experienced in and has a lot of assets in, and there's certain states that I have a lot of assets in. And that's one of the things that we're going to have each person take the lead on, and then the other person be that sounding board to review and basically, you know, ass not assist, but basically be, you know, question certain things or kind of be, you know, hey, this is what we're thinking, this is what we may do from that perspective. 
if it became a point where uh, we could not get a long, uh, then we of course would do what's in the best interest of the investors. Uh, you know, Jamie and I are also going to be investing in this fund, so we have uh, you know more than just management. Um, uh, you know, dollars or time spent into this. So we're going to also have our investment in that. Uh, we would have to come to some uh, agreement on, it would be, probably have to be a buyout um, from one person, somewhat buying out the other at no cost to the fund uh, from that perspective and determine it from that standpoint. And then that person would probably get to decide, but I'll be honest, um, you know, uh, Jamie and I have worked on other uh other projects. things, other projects, yes, uh, and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not just this fund that we have uh, uh, deals going on together. So it would have to be pretty massive and there would be, there would be a lot more yeah. uh, impact to other things we have going on than it would be this fund if something were to happen like that. Yeah, it's not just one JV deal and, and uh, you know, Chris yeah. has sold me assets and that kind of thing, but it's, we, we have probably... We have daily calls, put it that way. Um, several mm -hmm. things we're working on together, but it's a really good question because you never know. Mm -hmm. um, James Reardon, uh, as you both have other funds, are new purchase or sale of notes an arm's length transaction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, so answer that. So anything we buy uh, would not be from other funds, uh, and anything we sell uh, would be put on the open market. So uh, that's typically how I've done it in the past. Uh, and, you know, we put stuff on the open market. I've had investors in my funds buy assets, um, you know, from the fund because they were on the open market. And I, we treat them as if it is, um, you know, just a regular investor buying it. There's no preferential treatment because we have to look towards what's the best interest of the investors and they understand that as well so um, um how much are you looking to raise so the fund is uh right now up to 25 million for this first go around we're um phase we're looking to raise between one and three million dollars you've so, mentioned modifying modifying the operating agreement and amending the waterfall is that still the plan and has the oa been amended so okay. not sure we did amend the ppm uh slightly recently and that was pertaining to placing the management fee later yep. um in the cycle of things and then we may have tweaked something else i'm not sure yeah, what this there was another clause in there that there was a clawback that if we had paid interest or principal back that there's a potential for us to claw back that from an investor we remove that, so that is not allowed. But I think what Jerry is referring to was, yes, there was language in there that our management fee was before the preferred return, and we moved that to the back end. And the third thing we did is we uh, eliminated any language in there about leverage. There was some right. language originally in there, people may have seen it if you saw an early version, that we could leverage up to 60%. Uh, we just removed it because we know there's a lot of IRA investors. We had no intention ever to use it. So that's why. Right. Um, let, let me answer Ellen's because she mentioned mm -hmm. excess cash in past funds has been 50%. Those funds did not have a preferred return on them. So that's where I just wanted to make that comment. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll be frank with people. I have another fund that, uh, you know, did have, I think it was a slightly little higher pref and uh, preferred return uh, and you know just from a management standpoint uh, it's you know running numbers and understanding how things work um, you know kind of trial and error honestly um, that fund's going well um, and my investors are doing well uh, I'm not making anything on it I'm just being frank with people we needed to structure something that we thought was fair and equitable to everybody um, and again, we're trying to target that 11 to 15% return to investors. Uh, but we also, instead of making it a straight 50, 50, uh, the feedback we got from a lot of investors was they also prefer like that preferred return. So that way, if there was less money coming in the door, they were the ones reaping those benefits. Um, so 
couple of questions came in from different different places, but that are related. So the three year minimum, I mean, essentially we've touched on it a little bit already, but the initial subclass, which is an initial fund, think of it like that, will be a three year tie up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then we do plan to run additional subclasses after that. So mm -hmm. Um, does this mean the fund is only going to run for three years? Yes, but there likely will be additional opportunity. Yeah. So Charles actually hit it on the head. It's an evergreen fund with individual investments tied up for three mm -hmm. years. Thank yep. you, Charles, for explaining. There that you go. For us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to say it. Yeah. Um, um, and then Jim asked two different, or what if we're oversubscribed or undersubscribed? Um, I don't think we're going to be undersubscribed based on current commitments mm -hmm. and then oversubscribed. We could certainly, you know, hire additional help if need be. We're both fairly plugged into the kind of the note space. And I don't think we, we you know, I'll be honest, Chris is a machine with, you know, with your systems and everything. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we both have our systems down. I know I've in 2020 mm -hmm. really worked to get our, our systems really locked in. So um, there's certainly a number where we, we wouldn't, wouldn't go above, but uh, I'm not sure what that number is, frankly. Yeah, And here's, uh, I'll add to that question too, is if we felt we're at a number that we can't implement and get that money out the door, we're not going to take it, you know, right. from that perspective, um, you know, because if that money's sitting in the account and we can't buy assets and there's two things that go with that a is making sure it's assets that we're not going to force a buy. There's no chance. I'm going to force buying assets. And secondly, if the opportunity wasn't there, we're not going to have it just sitting in the account because it's not collecting. It's, it's not beneficial to either party. Um, but to be on to Jim, that number though, to be oversubscribed, uh, you know, would be somewhere probably um, in the, you know, you know, seven to $10 million range um, to give you an idea from that perspective. And I think the most logical move there would be to, yeah you know, shift investors to the next subclass. Um, if that, if that's what works for everyone. So, um, you said you expect the notes to get cheaper as foreclosures increase. What if this doesn't happen? Also what economic changes would negatively impact performance, higher interest rates, et cetera. Uh, good question. Good questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, so let me, so first, um, do we expect notes to get cheaper as foreclosures increase? Yes. But if they don't, you know, I'm still buying assets today. Like I mentioned earlier on, I bought, you know, a good amount of assets this year um, at very good pricing. Uh, from that perspective, I think pricing will probably slightly continue to do decrease over time. If it doesn't, I don't think it has a negative impact on our buying because we're going to bid based off of specific returns and we're not going to overpay. Now, economic changes that negatively impact performance, it wouldn't be high interest rates. Uh, if we were buying a lot more performing, I'd say it's jobs. Buying the non-performing, it's housing pricing. You know, is going to be now if we're buying non-performing that have equity in them, uh, it's not going to be. It pretty much won't have really any impact. A very slight. If it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar payoff on a hundred thousand dollar house that we may have bought for fifty thousand, uh, if that property now drops to 80,000, then yeah, there's a 20% um, decline in our profits and our profits on that deal might only be, um, you know, double digits or 10% versus the 30%. But it's something, you know, we're going to continue to monitor and watch uh, from that perspective. And, you know, when we buy assets, there is a science, there's an art and a science behind it. And, you know, there's, it's not just like you buy one asset, you really got to focus your portfolio and kind of sculpture that portfolio to minimize the risk. And how you do that is, you know, it's not simple. You know, as you start plugging in the pieces, um, as you start acquiring things, you have to start looking at, okay, I need some assets like this, like that, because you still want to maximize that return, but also minimize the risk. So that's one of the things that is, I think, challenging, but, you know, to be honest, Jamie and I, um, you know, have that experience. And that's one of the things why I think, you know, we can minimize that risk. The other things I'll mention about minimizing risk, for example, and Jamie, we're going to talk about this, but everyone talks about the three major components of note investing. You'll be careful of taxes, title, and, um, you know, basically, and, you know, 
property value slash insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. So for title, we struck a deal with a title company who gives us an insurance policy. If they screw up and miss a fact that taxes, they miss taxes were sold or anything along those lines, now they're ins we're insured up to fifty thousand dollars. So you know that's um, on that's on the title side of things. Um, but on taxes as well, you know we've got a backup to that is after we buy the asset, we've got a company that handles all the taxes for us. And what they're going to do is basically make sure taxes get paid. They run a report that shows us. Um, you know, at least once per year to twice per year, if it's delinquent, they'll run it to us. And if they screw up, again, we've got an insurance policy against them. And these are all written in contracts, by the way. And third is on the insurance um, component. We've got a deal with an insurance provider who basically the same thing. They're going to handle the insurance by sending the letters, doing all the work. And if something were to occur, we're covered. So, you know, we've looked at again, minimizing additional risk in assets because those are primarily the three that you look for. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that we're not gonna take the lead on, on monitoring all three of those. We certainly will. Oh, absolutely will. But it's, yeah, if, if somebody else screws up, because here's the thing people don't realize, you order a title report from a company and they completely screw it up and you spent 50 grand on that note and oh, it was sold at tax sale or this mortgage was satisf satisfied and they missed it. You know what they're gonna do? Oh, you paid 135 bucks for that report? Here's your $135 check, you know? And then you're gonna go kicking and screaming, and then they're gonna show you, well, it's for informational purposes only. You know, that's a risk I don't wanna take, Jamie don't wanna take, so we, you know, work deals out to make sure we have that. It took so us a while why, to find it. <laughs> so just, uh, I know we're running a little long on time, so a few more questions. Why limit the cap to uh, $400,000 value for an asset? I mean, honestly, it's just where the numbers work, where we have teams on the ground, where, where um, the, the laws, I mean, so much of this is very state specific with regard to the, the foreclosure laws and what judicial versus non-judicial, um, the numbers just don't, don't work in California for something. Well, here's the thing. We're probably not going to buy in California, A, but the other component to it is if you're buying an $800,000 note and they're delinquent, that person's going to have three attorneys basically fighting you tooth and nail. Yeah, and true. you're just going to run up legal costs, you know, very high. And that's why typically, like you mentioned, a $400,000 asset in, you know, Virginia or Northern Virginia where I am, you know, and a $400,000 asset in Fort Wayne, Indiana, nothing against Fort Wayne, uh, I got assets there, is going to be considerably different. It's probably a $2 million asset here. Another thing to mention with that real quickly is uh, most of the assets we buy are the mortgage payment is significantly lower than what the rent would be. So mm -hmm. that encourages the borrower to want to work with us. So when you're talking high end, $500 million, $2 million properties, that's typically not the case. So, you, you know, typically that mortgage payment is substantially higher than the rent would be in that area. Mm -hmm. And so we just feel like we work out of a, a position of strength in, in the yeah if you want to call it the lower, lower property values. Yeah. And, um, you know, from the, I'll also add to that is sellers on those higher notes want a significantly higher price right. on those from a percentage standpoint. So it gives you a lot less wiggle room if something were to go wrong uh, from that perspective. So, uh, and perfect example is I have a note right now in Maryland. It's a $550,000 house, $500,000 uh, mortgage on the property. And this, uh, borrower has already um, tried to get federal court involved twice. They've subpoenaed the FBI, the CIA. Um, oh, it's, yeah, this is an <laughs> awesome one. Um, they've gone through all these hoops because of, they're trying to say that they went through MERS and when MERS separates a mortgage from the assignment and, you know, it's basically gone through court twice for about five years. And, you know, the courts every time have basically said, you got a loan, you took the money, you can't keep the house and the money, you lose, sorry. Um, and they basically run out of options at that point. But um, you, know, you just find as you get to higher price assets, uh, it's some of the legal costs and some of the defenses get very unique. Mm -hmm. um, from where do you source most of your notes? I don't know if we're gonna disclose that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, I've, 
80% of my notes are bought from three funds, you know, and I bought, you know, and I continue to um, add additional funds. I've got uh, some due diligence I did last week on some assets from another fund as well, um, a larger fund who I'm looking to build a relationship with them. Uh, as you continue to grow and make a, you know, I bought a lot of assets from people and I do what I say I'm going to do. I close on the deals. You get, um, you know, they, they you come get, back to you. They come back to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that perspective. Uh, so I, I'll just mention, typically we are not buying from banks. Uh, it's not worth the marketing effort to call a lot of these small local community banks because a, they're not sure how to price these assets and they typically want too much for them. When I've got a stable of um, assets where on any given week, I'm probably getting 20 million in UPB sent to me um, to look at. So assets have never been a problem for me uh, from that perspective. I got to say, I really like Dan's questions. Uh, <laughs> what are your long-term professional goals? Where do you want to go with these funds over the coming years and decades? Why are you working this hard? <laughs> I'm not laughing at the question. It's, it's just, that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot. That's, um, mm -hmm. yeah. You have any thoughts, Chris? Uh, so yes, I do. Um, mine's probably going to be a little bit long winded. <laughs> um, but so for me, uh, you know, my long-term professional goals are to continue to grow in this space. Uh, I love this space. I'm energized by this. I love doing it. Uh, from that perspective, I want to eventually get out of the full-time nine to nine to five uh, component, uh, and I'm slowly making my way, you know, out of there. Um, and again, continue to grow these funds. Now, for me, I people say, "Well, why do you do it?" I kind of engineer things reverse. You know, I'll be 46 this year, and instead of, you know, working for the next 20 years, um, my note salary or money I make in notes is equivalent or more than actually what I make in my job. So I'm just backing up that every what you know, every year. I also got two colleges to pay for uh, from that perspective. But this is just something I'm passionate about. And I love, you know, and people I think, who know me know that based off of the podcast, the Facebook group and everything else. You know, people know me, I'm not out there trying to sell people on things. Um, you know, hey, go buy this, go buy that or whatever it is. I'm here to just share my stories, educate people, and kind of, you know, have people who want to be in this business space kind of just understand some of the things that have to go on. So that's where yeah. I want to go. Um, and I work hard because that's the type of person I am. Yeah. True story. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to, we, we can do a whole podcast episode on this, these topics, but um, I just love running my own business. I love working with people who like to take advantage or take control of their own future, their own financial situation. I love real estate. Um, so I still work two days per week for the department of defense. So I do have actually, believe it or not, a little more free time than Chris <laughs> to devote to this. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> well, it's debatable, but um, I don't know what, where I'll be in 10 years, but I absolutely love running my own business. I love real estate. I love notes. Mm. I love uh, personal finance and investing. So, um, it's kind of what motivates me yeah. and, um, uh, how much of our own money are we putting into the fund? So you want to take a yeah, crack at I that? I mean, I'll, well, I'll answer. Yes, I'm investing. I haven't finalized that amount yet. Uh, and here's the reason why is, you know, my wife and I are finishing up our taxes. Uh, you know, we're, we've got money put aside for this, but we also want to make sure we have money put aside for certain other things like college and so forth. So we don't want to, I'll say, oversubscribe ourselves to this and have to take money out later on. Um, so we haven't decided, I've I'm, I'm just been asked, I haven't decided yet uh, from that, but I'll be putting in, um, you know, we're definitely going to be investing. I know that, uh, you know, and I've got money already set aside um, that I can invest. It's just a matter of, am I putting that or am I putting more? So. My, for me, it'll be between, it'll be between 25 and hundred K. Yeah. So yeah, that's probably, I mean, that's my, my <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Numbers, yes, that's, that's where my range will be. Now I'll also mention, um, you know, for people, you know, well, if they said, well, why wasn't it more? Well, I also have um, several other funds that I'm managing that I also have, that I've invested in as well. And uh, notes is not, you know, the only thing that I invest in. Um, just like Jamie, and that's, I recommend everybody don't put all your 
eggs in one basket. Um, you know, I don't know what the doggy coin do or whatever today. Jim, <laughs> I don't know. know. <laughs> I still still uh, to Google yeah, what that actually do, is. Yeah, I don't <laughs> do stocks, Bitcoin. My wife does the stocks, but I've got a nephew who does that coin and he's made like 10 grand. So he's thinking he's a genius. Now. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Uh, we are actually hitting. Wow. We timed this perfectly with one hour. Um, anybody else have any questions? Is there anything we did not answer? Anything people would like us to answer uh, from that perspective? Uh, if people do have questions, you can email me, um, Chris at 70 Investments, and Jamie, your email is batemanjames at labradorlending.com. Uh, you know, if you guys uh, need to find us, we're pretty much easily available to find online as well. So. There is the, uh, you, we have the integritynotefund.com, and then I have some information on my website, labradorlending.com. Uh, I have an FAQ uh, sheet there as well. So, yep. And like I said, this is recorded. Uh, we'll also be sending out um, the slides, but it's going to be, there'll be more slides involved um, than what we did. We just kind of did a condensed version tonight. So you'll see uh, more detailed slides that we'll be sending out to people. So you'll have those uh, as well. Good. well. Nobody has any other questions. Uh, we'll wrap it up for the evening. And again, we want to thank everyone for spending the time this evening uh, to, you know, spend it with us uh, for this hour. We hope we were able to educate you. And like we mentioned early on, whatever decision or whoever you invest in, in any opportunity, please, please, please just do your due diligence on them. You know, it takes, and if you don't know what to do, email or call somebody, you know, if somebody said, hey, I'm not sure what to do, I can run a quick skip trace on that person in literally 30 seconds it cost me i think 80 cents um and you know mine's a dollar how'd you get that <laughs> because i run more than 150 a month um so i run Got it. Month, that's why um so yeah just you know we can we can search that information for you and trust me i don't charge people 80 cents to run it for them uh from that perspective so again thank you all for joining this evening and uh look forward to hearing from you later on thanks everyone